Ahoy, ye lovers! Welcome aboard the Steampunk Desperado channel. Topic of the day is pirates, or in the old timey spelling, pirates. Everybody loves pirates, right? As long as they're the comical variety like Jack Sparrow, played by Johnny Depp in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. It's also one of those few types of characters that we can still all play at Halloween without being canceled by a mob of woke Karens. <laughs> but what is the true history of these notorious characters? Are they noble outlaws or were they the vilest form of humanity? In this video, we're going to talk about several interesting books on pirates, most of which are non-fiction. Three of those non-fiction books are modern and one was written in the early 18th century when the pirates were still on their pirating ways. It had the amazing title, A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates. Of course, this is just a tiny fraction of the books that were written about this topic uh, of both types, fiction and nonfiction. Although piracy has been with us for as long as humanity has gone to sea, even back in the days of the Roman Empire, most of these books concern what we call the golden age of piracy. Wikipedia defines that as the period from around 1650 to almost 1730. Now, there were three distinct periods of this era, all of which involved conflict, which was kind of an excuse for pirating. The first was the French versus the Spanish, which is where the buccaneers originated. The second is Christians versus Muslims in the um, pirating of the Mughal Empire's ships. And lastly, we have the Wars of Spanish Succession, which actually involved most of the countries of Europe. During that war, from 1701 to 1714, there were a lot of privateers uh, that were commissioned to attack the ships of the enemy. And this continued in, in the illegal form of pirating um, from 1715 to 1726. We'll get more into detail about this later. There are hundreds and hundreds of books about pirates, hundreds of fictional books. And if you read any of them, you have to read this one, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson published back in 1883 by Castle and Company, in which the young Jim Hawkins, an innkeeper's son, gets embroiled in a sea adventure to retrieve buried treasure and to survive these uh, nasty, notorious pirate characters. Now, this is the book which created many of the pirate stereotypes that we know and love, especially like involving the one-legged cook, Long John Silver. When we talk like a pirate, it is he we are imitating. Arr. It also gives us tropes like the eye patch, the peg leg, the parrot on the captain's shoulder, squawking, pieces of eight, pieces of eight. Though this is an exciting adventure for young readers, it originated a lot of myths, some which didn't hold true, like the idea that pirates routinely buried their treasure on desert islands, which, to my knowledge, never happened. In reality, pirates mostly like to spend their treasure. <laughs> but this book, though, as being a great book, has been adapted many, many times, beginning as a silent film in 1918. Wikipedia lists 23 films, three being made for TV, and about a dozen television series. Several of these adaptations go into space for sci-fi pirate stories, such as Disney's 2002 animated film, Treasure Planet, which was actually not that bad, surprisingly. Now, speaking of Disney, of course, we have the enormously popular Pirates of the Caribbean series, char starring, of course, Johnny Depp as Jack Sparrow. I'm not going to say much about these because so many channels have already reviewed them and uh, basically analyzed these films to death. These movies work from a lot of those stereotypes, including the lovable rogue, who... Um, in this case, Jack, who walks with his pronounced sway. Maybe it's from being aboard ship, or maybe it's because he's drunk, uh, which is very true to life, because pirates were usually drunk. And uh, while we're on the idea of fiction, I'm going to mention one more fictional book, which I read recently. 
um, because it's by one of my favorite steampunk and fantasy writers, Tim Powers. It's called On Stranger Tides, published in 1987 by Ace Books. Now, if that title sounds familiar, it should. Uh, the story's protagonist is Jack Shandy, a young puppeteer turned pirate. And it concerns his adventures in the Caribbean, including encounters with voodoo magic and a search for the Fountain of Youth. It features several historical characters, such as the notorious Blackbeard and the female pirate Anne Bonny, and, and others, many others. What makes it particularly relevant is that it was loosely adapted for the fourth Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Yes, it was called Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides. Comparing the two, the book and the movie, there are very major differences, such as Jack Shandy not being in the movie at all. He's kind of replaced by Jack Sparrow, and who is nothing like. They're nothing like each other, basically. And uh, the story is considered considerably different, although the, some of the premises are the same. Now, I think, at least I've heard, that Disney did this primarily because they'd been sued for plagiarism for the first three movies, saying, oh, it's like my story or it's like my video game. And so they figured if we license the book <laughs> and adapt some of it, then we're home free, right? Now, it's, it's interesting. It's fun. Watch it if you get a chance. But I'm mostly going to talk about the nonfiction, about the real story of the pirates. And I didn't really get interested in that until... I think about 15 years ago, when I first encountered a book called Under the Black Flag, The Romance and the Reality of Life Among the Pirates by David Cordingly, 2006 Random House. And there's a big spate of books about pirates at the time. Maybe it has something to do with the movies. I don't know. I found this book in a discount bin, actually, but it was pretty good. What got my attention was the cover, black and red with the skull and cross cutlasses in white. And it turned out to be pretty fascinating. It got into the backstory behind the pirate phenomenon. The idea I found most interesting was that the pirate problem was largely something that European powers brought upon themselves <laughs> uh, through kind of a lot of missteps. There was a war called the War of the Spanish Succession, which was when the Europeans couldn't agree on who would succeed the uh, very sickly and inbred Spanish king. What was it? Philip II, Charles II, something like that. Anyway, they they all had their own candidates for who they thought should take the throne, you know, their relatives and so on. So it, it basically ended up with Britain and the Netherlands and Portugal against France and Spain and among other countries. But most of them didn't have a lot of seafaring ships. As far as the naval parts of the war, the European countries, especially Britain, uh, quickly found that they were spending a lot of money and, and losing a lot of lives in these pitched battles that didn't accomplish much. And they decided to go to the time-honored practice of privateering, in which they would license various private ships, armed private ships, to attack the enemy vessels, in particular their trade, their merchant vessels, you know, basically break the back of the Spanish Empire by you know, stopping their shipments of provisions to their colonies in Latin America and the treasure coming back to Spain. So that had a lot of influence on the war, but eventually it ended. And once that war was over, they had dumped all these sailors on the job market and there was no work to be had. Besides which, a lot of them had really come to enjoy the privateering life. Now, since they couldn't legally privateer anymore, since there was peace, they became pirates. Now, some of them said at first, I'm just going to attack the Spaniards because I still hate them and they're my country's enemies. And in, in fact, the Spanish authorities in Cuba were making life very difficult for the British sailors from Jamaica and other places. So they had a legitimate grievance. But in any case, you know, quickly the British authorities decided they had to crack down on these pirates because it was making things hot for them with the Spaniards. Now, of course, by this time, the pirates got kind of angry and said, well, if you're going to be that way, we're going to attack British ships too. And of course, French and Dutch and all of them, basically. So it became so bad that um, 
they had to send out naval ships. They had to send a special governor to the Bahamas, which was a known pirate haven. So he said to the king, let's, let's declare an amnesty and we'll get as many of these pirates to turn themselves in and we'll clear out the seas because otherwise they know they're going to be hanged. So they're going to fight to the death, right? So that was ostensibly successful. Tons of pirates turned themselves in. Some went back to England and lived lives of very wealthy men with their ill-gotten gain, bought big estates and, you know, had uh, young hot wives and all that stuff. Whereas others said, you know what, I'm bored. I'm going to go back to pirating. And so the problem continued until they were able to use sufficient force to basically capture all these pirates and hang hundreds of men. And finally brought the era to a close around 1726. Now, besides this fascinating story, one of this author's goals was to de-romanticize the idea of pirates and piracy, portraying them as mostly pathetic alcoholic losers <laughs> who turned to crime to support themselves. And you know, the life of pirate was also kind of difficult in many cases. You know, they'd eat, have to eat wormy biscuits and they'd have to, you know, be out in stormy seas and be swept aboard and, and be plagued with scurvy and other diseases. So, on the other hand, pirate crews were run democratically, with the crew voting on all matters of importance. So I'll get into this later. There was another book I saw on Audible recently that I could not pass up, and that was Blackbeard, America's Most Notorious Pirate, by Angus Constum, 2007 pa Trade Paper Press. You notice all these new books tended to be around this time, it seems like. Blackbeard was a nom de guerre of the infamous pirate Edward Teach, also Edward Thatch. Nobody knows for sure what his real name was. <laughs> um, although some writers say that there were uh, families called Thatch in Scotland, so that must be the real name. Who knows? Who knows? Now, he was widely feared, and he was fearsome and fierce and could be ruthless. But on the other hand, he had a reputation of dealing fairly with uh, sailors who surrendered and cooperated with him. He'd often let them go. He'd just take the stuff he wanted and say, go on your way. He could be a bit of a psychopath, though. <laughs> and, for example, there's a story that tells how he shot his quartermaster, Israel Hand. Now, the quartermaster was like the number two official on a pirate vessel. He was the judge of all disputes, and he handled all the treasure. So he was second in importance to the captain. Now, for whatever reason... And they were sitting in the ca in the cabin. I don't know. Maybe they were playing cards. Maybe they were drinking. Whatever. And uh, he basically shot a hand's leg under the table with his pistol. And later on, he said, "If I don't shoot somebody once in a while, the crew's not going to respect me, right?" <laughs> so who knows why? In another way, Hand may have later thanked him for doing this because he was not captured with the rest of Blackbeard's crew. And, you know, in the raid when they were had to bring the Virginia militia in to cap, capture him because North Carolina couldn't deal with him. And uh, so he was not hanged along with the rest of Blackbeard's crew. And he actually went back to England, although many people say he died penniless. He also goes into a lot of um, Blackbeard's associates, including like his, his mentor, Benjamin Hornigold, who had been a privateer who turned pirate. And also the weird, odd, odd uh, dandy pirate, Steed Bonnet, who had been an aristocrat in Barbados, who decided to go pirating and leave behind his boring uh, married life. He was incompetent, so basically other pirates ended up running his ship for him. So the problem is that Blackbeard's early life is really spotty, so the author had to kind of reach for any information he could find. He had to visit all these former places where Blackbeard used to hang out and uh, try to fill in the gaps. But still a fascinating book. Now, one of his primary sources for anything you said about Blackbeard was that book I talked about earlier, A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates, which was also called A General History of the Pirates. It was written by Captain Charles Johnson. Now, an interesting fact is that there was no such person to anybody's knowledge. So it must have been a pen name 
Some allege that the real author was Daniel Defoe of Robinson Crusoe fame. But you have to ask yourself, why would Defoe stay anonymous when this was such a best-selling book? You know, probably approaching you know, Robinson Crusoe's popularity. Anyway, whoever wrote it, uh, it was published in 1724 by Charles Rivington. Now, some experts say that the real author was actually Nathaniel Mist, who was a publisher at the time. And maybe Mist figured he didn't have the credentials to pull this off in a believable fashion. So he'd invent this persona of a sea captain. Maybe so. So this was available for free on Gutenberg.org. And I said I had to read it. It's got an interesting structure. It's basically 20 plus biographies of pirates, of the most notorious ones. And some of them are short, some are long, depending upon the man's career. In that sense, it can be a bit repetitive, um, but it is interesting. It's got a rather strident anti-pirate tone, of course, because at the time they were still a problem. And one of the most amusing things is this quaint 18th century language and spellings, including what I love to say as pirate, the spelling of the word pirate, P-Y-R-A-T-E. And I also love all the nautical terminology, which they kind of take for granted that the reader knows. Um, for example, all these different types of sailing vessels, galley, snow, frigate, schooner, bark, brigantine, sloop, pink, pinnace, etc. What are they? What does the modern people know about this thing? Anyway, he also uses all these shortened versions of nautical phrases, such as way instead of way anchor, and uh, strike for strike the colors, which means you surrender to the pirates. And also um, clean, which means you bring your ship onto shore and clean off those nasty uh, ship worms, which were basically like the termite to the sea. They would eat your ship out from under you, especially in the warm Caribbean where they thrived. It's interesting to note how many regular sailors would willingly join the pirates when their ship was taken and sometimes the entire crew. And of course, when they're caught and tried, they were hanged along with the rest. But they would try to get off because they would claim, oh, I was under duress. And sometimes this was true, but it was very difficult to pull this off, this, uh, this defense, unless they had refused all booty. Any time they would take some of the prizes, their share, they would consider the court would say, no, you were pirating. I'm sorry. <laughs> you were not against your will. Some pirates, notably Blackbeard and his mentor Hornigold, would have a gentlemanly approach. If you didn't resist, he would often just let you go and just take what he wanted. Uh, others were total psychopaths who would love to murder and torture people just for fun. I know there was a guy named Captain Lowe who was into that and all of his crew just really enjoyed like burning people to death and, and so on, hacking them to pieces and, and all this horrible stuff. And they would like destroy merchandise just out of spite. Oh, I don't want these fancy silks from the Orient. I'm just going to throw them overboard. The most interesting bits concerned the two most notable female pirates, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, who lived extremely fascinating lives. Mary Reed's mother early on disguised her as a boy. And this was because the girl was illegitimate and she had had a legitimate child by her now missing husband, a boy who had died in his infancy. So she said, oh, this is that same boy. <laughs> and uh, he just didn't grow very well. <laughs> so anyway, Mary Reed ended up living as a man and uh, joining the army. She could probably pull it off because there were so many teenage boys in the army at that time fighting these wars, but she ended up in all these relationships with male soldiers, I know, who had to learn her secret, obviously. And so you wouldn't say that she identified as a man, no, she was just impersonating a man. Uh, very similar with Anne Bonny, and her story is a little bit more interesting because there's this weird love triangle, you know, her father was rich, was sleeping with the maid, and is, ends up getting the wife and the maid pregnant at about the same time. <laughs> so very scandalous. Bonnie was the daughter of the maid. And they went to America. He was in disgrace for, for this affair. And she was raised very oddly. And again, 
often as a boy, and ended up going to sea, impersonating a man, but having a relationship with a man, and uh, ended up on the same ship with uh, Mary Reed. Now, when they were captured, both women were pregnant, which gave them the stay of execution, except that Anne Bonny died in prison, and Mary Reed, who knows? She may have escaped. She may have been pardoned. We don't know. Now, part of this book was a little dull because there was a lot of lists of, of uh, people and uh, trials and so on, transcripts of the trials of uh, Roberts's crew. Now, he had already been killed in battle, but it's interesting because so many of these guys were so young. They list the ages. There was a guy that was 17, and then there was a guy who was 74. So, interesting. I don't recommend it to anybody unless you're really into pirates and history. Very recently, I decided to try one more because this book kept showing up in lists of histories of the pirates. The Republic of Pirates by Colin Woodard, 2008 Mariner Books. Again, published right around that same window. Uh, it's interesting. This book has a lot of the same content as the others, but packaged in a different way. One of the author's goals seems to be to stress the positive aspects rather than the negative, like um, the, the Black Flag did. And such is the fact that pirate ships were usually run democratically. And this was an escape for sailors who had been abused in the Royal Navy and on merchant ships where the captain's word was law. And he could have you flogged half to death for a minor infraction. And often you didn't get the pay you were due and so on. So they were very embittered. Also, pirate crews often accepted slaves as full members, which sometimes free them from slave ships. Although at other times they would often just sell them for the money. <laughs> anyway, he has this idea that the pirates were essentially their own government because they pretty much ran the Bahamas for a while. It was a pirate haven, which he calls the Pirate Republic, which were basically at war with Britain and Spain and France and all those other major powers. And almost like they're Robin Hoods trying to overturn the system, which I think is stretching it a bit. <laughs> Mostly they were just in it for the money <laughs> and, and the plunder and, on, and the booty, as we say. Um, he also spends a lot of time on the life of Captain Woods Rogers, who was the privateer turned pirate hunter who helped bring the Golden Age to a close. He was appointed as governor for the Bahamas when they were cleaning out the pirates. And uh, an interesting aside, in his life as a privateer earlier on, you know, he was in a ship that was down around the um, Cape Horn in South America. They stopped for provisions at this desert island where they saw goats. And they were surprised to find a European man in skins who had been living by himself for many years. It was Alexander Selkirk who had been marooned there. And he was later the model for uh, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> anyway, so what lessons can we learn from the age of the pirates? Well, first of all, it's that good intentions sometimes go awry. The idea of using private vessels in the war efforts seemed like a good idea at first, but eventually came back to bite the countries who used this strategy. As far as the pirates themselves, it's amazing to note how much sympathy there was among the general public, even though they were horrible people in most ways. You know, there were those few that acted sort of gentlemanly, or at least they were good at that kind of PR. And so the public, especially people who were like frustrated in their lives, would think, wouldn't it be great if I could go out a pirate in? <laughs> so as you can see, we have a lot of great books about pirates. And you really need to check these out if you're at all interested especially that last one, Republic of Pirates, because it's written kind of like fiction. And uh, although the author does take great pains to be accurate, I think. It really jives with a lot of other, other um, stuff I've read, including, including the Baroque cycle. There are things he mentions that occur in Neil Stevenson's historical work as well. So this has been my show concerning the history and literature of the pirates. So hope you liked it. Let me know what you think in the comments below, good or bad. I can take it. Please like and subscribe to get out the good 
Steam Punk Word to the World. And also check out my books on Amazon. The links are in the description as always. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying, Godspeed me hearties from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.